Hello, loyal audience of the Game Time Decision Podcast. Uh, when, wherever you may be listening to this, whenever, it is currently Wednesday, July 5th, and the day after, A, America's birthday, and B, maybe more importantly, the day after Gordon Hayward's announcement that he intends to sign with the Boston Celtics. What a great day it is for Celtics Nation and all fans of the team. You know, there was a lot of anxiety amongst Celtics fans and all of the NBA yesterday when Chris Haynes of ESPN tweeted out that Hayward did intend to sign with the Celtics, but then later Adrian Wojnarowski of uh, ESPN, formerly The Vertical, who I will touch on in a little bit, uh, he reported that Hayward's agent reached out to him saying that no deal was final and that they were still having to regroup and make their decision. Um, I just want to say that that was complete malarkey. Um, the real reason, and Adam Himmelsbach of the Boston Globe hit hit the nail on the head. Before, when the whole situation was unfolding, um, right after the announcement of the, uh, after Chris Haynes' um, tweet, and then uh, Chris Mannix and Zach Lowe confirming, the, um, and then the half hour later where Hayward's agent and said that there was no final decision made, the... Um, uh, uh, Himmelsbach just said, well, it will most likely be an announcement of the, from the Players' Tribune. Hayward wanted to let the Jazz know himself, and then he wanted to go on his terms, and he would cite Brad Stevens as the reason for signing with the Celtics to soften the blow um, for Utah. And he was exactly right. Uh, Hayward had his decision made. Um, I believe, in hindsight, looking back, he's had his decision made for a while. Uh, his relationship with Brad Stevens is strong and stronger than all of us have thought. Even those who have said, you know, he's going to come with, come to the Celtics, we really underestimated how strong of a relationship Gordon Hayward has with Brad Stevens dating back to his high school days as a tennis player at Indiana. So now you look, and um, last podcast that we did um, at my house, not at the GTSN studios, um, with Pat, Chris, and guest uh, Dan Greenberg, it was... Uh, just hours before July 1st um, and free agency and literally minutes before we recorded it minutes before the Paul George trade, which is crazy. So a lot of things to catch up on. Um, Pretty much all the major dominoes have fallen. Blake Griffin um, back to LA. Uh, Jimmy Butler at the draft traded to um, Minnesota. Uh, Obviously, Gordon Hayward to the Celtics, Chris Paul to the Rockets, Danilo Gallinari in a three-team trade to uh, the Clippers, and Paul Millsap over to Denver. Uh, so the uh, other than just, don't want to say minor guys, but non-stars uh, trying to let the dust settle and find a home, the offseason uh, free agency, for the most part, is settled. Um, Obviously, no deals are official until tomorrow, July 6th, after the moratorium, because this is technically just a legal tampering um, period of six days where teams can have contact with players and they can come to verbal agreements, but nothing is yet official. But I do want to say the Celtics offseason, if Gordon Hayward did not come here, was on the verge of an F. Because not only did you miss out on Paul George or Jimmy Butler, you lost out. You would have lost out on Gordon Hayward and Blake Griffin, and the real reason why that would have been so damaging to the Celtics' progression is not only because of losing, of missing out on a very talented All-Star franchise-level player in free agency. The real detriment that losing out on Gordon Hayward would have been is that we freed up this cap space, this twenty-nine point seven million dollars for this season specifically for a Gordon Hayward or Blake Griffin. The, and the, it's not, and even though people say, oh, it's just money, you'll have it. Next year is where the rubber meets the road. Isaiah Thomas, who I still am reluctant to give a max contract to, is a free agent, will be a free agent, a, uh, coming off making $6.2 million this year, at least, at the very least, going to make four to five times more per year. Avery Bradley at around $8.8 million, one of the uh, best contracts in basketball expiring he will be up and he will be looking and pro and most definitely will get a deal north of 20 of 20 million even up to 25 million marcus smart restricted free agent depending on how he does if he can shoot the ball 
not not even shoot the ball at a elite level or a high level, just shoot the ball at a league average level. He could be a 15 to even 18, 19 million dollar player with the way he impacts games and win and uh, impacts winning and is a versatile guard who can defend up to three, four positions. So our cap space will be evaporated next year. We needed to spend money this off season, or else it would have been all for naught. Passing on Jimmy Butler, passing on Paul George, passing on any possible move, waiting too long to let Paul George go to another team or Jimmy Butler go to another team would have been all for naught. So this leads me to believe that Danny Ainge had a very strong feeling and was almost certain all along, at least for the past, since the trade deadline at least, that Gordon Hayward would be um, taking his talents up to Boston, which is so great to say. Um, no more speculation, no more just, well, if, if he comes, or it's likely he'll come, but no, he's here. So Danny Ainge must have known that because otherwise he would be looking like a real fool right now. But one thing I do want to say, and not to rain on Celtics fans parade because it's been a great offseason so far, but you have to look at the trade um, that was completed um, last week between the Indiana Pacers and the Oklahoma City Thunder, where the Oklahoma City Thunder pretty much traded Serge Ibaka, one year of Serge Ibaka, for one year of Paul George. So that is A-plus GMing by Sam Presti. Uh, and you have to think, you can be critical of Ainge, and I was certainly critical of Ainge, but what a doofus, idiot, stupid, stupid person is Kevin Pritchard. Oh my god, he should be he should have been fired on the spot. Indiana Pacer ownership should have stepped in and say, "No, no, 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 no. You don't do that deal because that is stupid." You're telling me Victor Oladipo on an albatross ridiculous contract at 22 million a year for for the next 3 years cuz he signed it last year. So, 3 years are for at 22 million a year or what however much. You're paying Victor Oladipo that much? Really? Oh my! And Demontis Sabonis, who was the eleventh pick and had what six points a game and over twenty minutes per game last year, not impressive whatsoever. Didn't even shoot forty uh, percent from the floor. What a ridiculous move by the Indiana Pacers! And you know what? All I can say is, if you want to say that Kevin Pritchard did not want to deal within the conference, why? Don't you want to do what's best for your team? Like, I don't get why he was in such a rush. I need to make a move before free agency starts. Are you kidding me? Why? Because you're going to have more and more teams into it. Think about it. Before free agency started and before um, the Chris Paul trade, Houston wasn't really looking. I mean, there, there might have been some rumors, but they weren't looking to go all in to get a guy like Paul George. Well, they got CP3, and now they're looking to build a big three, a real big three of three top ten players in basketball. Uh, you look at the Celtics. They were reluctant to get in on Paul George until they officially were conf they, they were uh, Gordon Hayward confirmed he would be coming to the Celtics. That that expanded the market. You really you're telling me that Oklahoma City was really going to pull that offer? I mean, I could see if they had to involve uh, maybe Stephen Adams or Enos Cantor or one of those players along with Oladipo or Sabonis or future first round picks because those could end up being valuable if Westbrook and George do walk like something of real value, but. Even up until the trade deadline, I'm pretty sure that even for a half a season of Paul George is worth more than a Victor Oladipo on a terrible contract and DeMontis Sabonis. So uh, that was just really stupid. And all I can say is um, Kevin Pritchard bit off his nose to spite his face. He didn't want to make Cleveland better. He didn't want to make Boston better. So he took the first deal that he got, which wasn't even decent. I, I would say it's a decent return, but I mean, unless they have some infatuation that... Uh, Oladipo played for Indiana back in college. I mean, really, like, I, I I mean, he's been in the league for four years. I mean, of course he can get better, but pretty much all he is is, like, I, I don't even know, like, I'm trying to think of a comp. I mean, like, I don't want to say, like, almost like Dwayne Wade now. Not like, I don't think he ever has the potential to become Dwayne Wade. But what Dwayne Wade is, like, at right now at 35, like, 18 points a game, like, four rebounds, like, a decent player, but I don't think he's going to improve that much. He came into the league pretty late. I'm pretty sure he's like in his mid twenties. He's at least 25, 26 now. I would say, Oladipo is. So, um, how much can you like? How much more growth potential is there in Sabonis? A, a late lottery pick, 10, 11th he was last year. Um, e even off the gate, like off the bat, that's like 
not that's like far from a sure thing. And he didn't really do much in his first year to show that he's a worthwhile investment. So I, I think that deal would have been on the table all along. And even a deal of Avery Bradley, Marcus Smart, and Jay Crowder would have, and along with a Mem- the Memphis pick, people talk about it like it's not valuable. It's top eight protected in 2019. Then in 2020, it goes to top six protection. But then if that never gets conveyed, that can be, uh, um, that's unprotected. So you really look, if Me- if Memphis gets bad and the way the Western Conference is shaking out, right now they're not a playoff team. So they'll at least be in the lottery next year, I assume. And then next year, they um, obviously Zach Randolph's gone, Jermichael Green might be gone. You have Marcus Gasol, who next year will be 33, 34. Mike Conley um, getting into his early 30s. Tony Allen will be gone, like... They're not going to have a lot. Uh, Chandler Parsons on that terrible deal will, will handicap them from uh, being major players, along with the fact that their market is Memphis. So that team could be pretty bad. And you know what? If like if next year or 2019 you get a uh, like a top 10 pick, that's pretty valuable. Uh, definitely more valuable than Victor Oladipo on a bad contract. So uh, that deal in its of itself, I think um, Memphis is our most underrated asset in terms of our draft pick selection. That that pick really could be something down the road, could be a top 10 pick. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, the Clippers pick, Blake Griffin, um, not going to say saved us because that pick really isn't that valuable, um, but at least Blake Griffin staying in LA and the possibility that if they're a bad playoff team, like if they're an eighth seed in the West, which is kind of what they're looking right now with the moves Minnesota made, with um, the move uh, the Nuggets made, with another year of progression for Jokic and Gary Harris and Jamal Murray, um, that team, even though they lost Gallinari, bringing in Paul Millsap, uh, uh, LA's looking more and more like an eighth seed team, which would be quite perfect for the Celtics, because if you can get the 15th, 16th pick from LA, that's the best you can get, because obviously it's lottery protected and I'm sorry, the uh, mid-first round pick is infinitely more valuable than two seconds. Um, so th- that's kind of just asset watch uh, for 2019, which only Celtics fans do because what other team has just so many assets like this? Um, but you really need to cash it in. So, uh, you know, uh, this won't. This certainly won't be the first move. It might be the biggest, obviously, go- uh, signing Gordon Hayward. Four years, uh, $128 million, uh, but... If you look at it, th- there will be more moves to come, whether it's just trading like Rozier or um, obviously Jarebko, Amir Johnson, T- Zeller, um, Gerald Green, Demetrius Jackson. Those guys will all likelihood be gone, except for maybe Gerald Green will come back on a veteran's minimum deal. But other than that, um, all those end of the roster, bought like 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 15th men on the team um, will be gone which, who cares, uh, but you now look, and if you, because we do intend to give Gordon Hayward the full max, who do we trade in? It's down to Marcus Smart, Jay Crowder, and Avery Bradley, and I would say without a doubt, the man, and I've been saying this for over a year, is Avery Bradley. Avery Bradley, what he did in the playoffs was tremendous. He averaged close, in the regular season, close to 16 points a game, six rebounds, he shot very well from the field, very well from three. He has really turned himself into one of the best two-way players in the game. I, I would go as far to say Avery Bradley might be one of the best non-All-Stars in the league. Uh, just what he does is so understated. He's such a great player. Uh, but he's at $8.8 million this year, which is a great figure and attractive to a lot of teams. But at this time next year, you'll be doing, you'll be making the face about Avery Bradley that you made last year when you found out Evan Turner got four years, $72 million. You'll be saying, Avery Bradley got how much? Uh, people are saying he might get 20. Avery Bradley might get 26, 27, maybe like... like J- J.J. Redick is a better shooter, but that's about it. Avery Bradley is a way better player, and J.J. Redick got $23 million per year. Otto Porter uh, got an offer of, of over $26 million per year. I know he's younger with more upside, but still... Right now, Avery Bradley's a better player, and he'll only be 27 years old. So, you look at this. this Avery, Avery Bradley could get north of $25 million per year. And the way I look at it is, unless you're a championship, a high-level championship contender, right now the Celtics are uh, 
an Eastern Conference Finals favorite to make it there. I think they have a puncher's, uh, where I wouldn't say this last year, they have a puncher's chance against Cleveland. Say what you want, 15, 20%, depends on the, I don't want to even say chemistry because uh, you know how Cleveland can turn the switch, but you know, Kevin Love, Kevin Love's brittle, and, and basically how, how well defined it is, if, if Celtics fans want to get into the injury game, well, if LeBron gets hurt, last year the Celtics were a LeBron injury away from having a good chance to beat Cleveland. With Gordon Hayward in the fold, with Isaiah Thomas and Al Horford, they're now a Kevin Love injury or a, uh, away. So that's kind of the difference. So, and I think that's much more favorable because there is a, a, a chance Kevin Love gets hurt, and B, all you need is that, like, it, it lessens the gap. So now you look at it. Um, I think the Celtics do have a puncher's chance. I, I definitely think right now, uh, the way it currently stands, at least a six game series. Um, and who knows if the Celtics do make another move, which is unlikely, but you heard Marc Gasol today. I don't know how likely that is, but uh, bringing in a Marc Gasol could definitely, I'm not going to say make the Celtics favorites over Cleveland, but that would definitely push it to a seventh game. And if the Celtics were to get home court advantage and have a better record in the regular season, then I would say the Celtics are creeping up to like a 40% chance to beat Cleveland and a, a legitimate shot, not just a puncher's chance. So y- you look at that and... um. Just to kind of move along, one thing that is really irking me and pissing me off to no end is the blatant disrespect that the national media and the NBA writers and people uh, who they, who say, oh, they know basketball, basketball, and said, you, if you, they, the way people are disrespecting Al Horford is really bugging me right now. Because on today, with um, on Undisputed with uh, Skip and Shannon, I didn't watch it, but people share clips, and I saw it online, like, oh, the Celtics now say they have a big three, and then you can hear Skip Bayless saying, well, who's the third? I mean, you have Isaiah and Horford. I mean, Isaiah and Hayward. Wow, Horford's not big. Just because Al Horford doesn't average 20 and 10 does not mean he is a not, he's not a top 25 player in basketball and an elite player. Watch the game. If Al Horford, I mean... How many guys average 14 points, six, six to seven, reba- six, seven rebounds, and five assists a game? I know I'm bringing up numbers, but he is a complete player. He, he's an underrated defender. And just, you don't ha- just because you're, especially in today's NBA, this is what I'm saying. Just because you're not the prototypical center who just stays in the paint and blocks shots and grabs a bunch of, gar- a bunch of rebounds doesn't mean you're not a good defender. Al Horford is athletic enough and has the size and is versatile enough to switch on to a guy, to a small forward. Al Horford, my main argument, and um, you want to talk about rebounding, uh, and he gets hammered for his offensive re- rebounding numbers. Al Horford was not brought in to rebound the ball. Um, of course, that's uh, it's, well, it's one of his skill sets, but that was not the main reason he brought he was brought in. You look at the Celtics guards. Avery Bradley averaged almost seven rebounds per game. Marcus Smart was at around five rebounds per game. Even Isaiah tracked down three boards per game. You look at all these guys grabbing rebounds. Crowder, five, six a game. Al, that was a product of Al Horford. Just because Al Horford isn't grabbing the rebounds and having it put into a stat column doesn't mean he doesn't help the team on the boards because what he does on the offensive end, dragging Marching Gortat out of the paint, dragging Robin Lopez out of the paint, that allows guys to cut and guys to slash and get to the rim and not only score but also grab rebounds. So that is huge. And you look at it, um, Isaiah Thomas every year has gotten better. But I think had the Celtics not signed Al Horford last year, Isaiah Thomas might have been an all-star. But his season, his numbers in his season and the Celtics as a whole would pretty much be the same exact thing they were in 2015-16. Fourth, fifth seed in the East first round exit. Isaiah might have been looking at 23, 24 points a game on 41, 42% shooting, where this year he was at 29 points per game and 46% shooting. Al Horford spacing the floor, uh, getting, uh, unclogging the paint, allowing Isaiah to do what he does best is dr- and drive. That made Isaiah Thomas the player he's now. And uh, his, about his ability to shoot is so understated. So just because Al Horford averages 14 points instead of 18 points, and has seven rebounds per game instead of uh, nine rebounds per game does not make him uh, a bad player. He is certainly at uh, the top 25 player, and um, I think 
uh, at least up until yesterday, he was the best player on the Celtics. Now with Gordon Hayward, I think Hayward takes that position. But Al Horford's so underrated, and the national media, they need to watch basketball. And I know it, because as a Celtics fan, I get the privilege and the ability to watch Al Horford play d- uh, day in and day out. And if you had asked me before Al Horford came to the Celtics, and if I hadn't watched him as much, although I did get to watch a good amount of Hawks basketball because uh, they uh, met the Celtics in the playoffs last year, and I was able to watch Al Horford Eastern Conference. But if I was if I didn't watch Al Horford every day, I would I would probably be singing the same tune. But these guys, you need to watch the game and appreciate the subtle nuances of what Al Horford does because his passing from the low block and fr- and from the elbow. Is unparalleled. I mean, you can. I mean, I can only name three, four guys on as big men who pa- who are even close to him, and that's Nikola Jokic, Blake Griffin, and Marcus Gasol, who I will touch on in a minute. Um, that's it. So he's a top five passing big man in the league. He's one of the he's a, one of the better shooters uh, for big men in the league, and he's just an all around player. And I I wish if Al Horford could just get to sixteen points a game and eight rebounds, people would say, oh well, yeah, Al, oh well, yeah, Al Horford's top twenty five. But just because he averages two less points a game and two and one and a half less rebounds per game, even though his team wins and he impacts winning and he helps his other players get better, he allows his point guard to go from 22 points a game on 40% shooting to 29 points a game on 46% shooting. That doesn't get noticed, the, what, the, what he does. But uh, all right, that's enough for my Al Horford talk. And I will tag his sister, Anna Horford. Shout out. Great follow on Twitter. Uh, hopefully she listens to this, but she knows what's up. Uh, so that's that. And now I will go on to the rumor of the day, which I don't really buy that much into, which is Mark Gasol. Um, he is one of the best defenders in the league. Um, again, people say, he's not that good. He only gets six rebounds per game. Wa- I watch him play. And I'll admit, I don't watch a ton of Grizzlies basketball, but I kind of look at them as like the off-brand Spurs, like... They try to play like the Spurs, like they try to have Marc Gasol do what Tim Duncan does, and they try to have Mike Conley be Tony Parker, and like they try to have like it was like I don't know who they have back in the day, Rudy Gay, uh, OJ Mayo, try to be like that uh, Manu, and uh, they had Tony Allen as the tough defender, kind of like the Bruce Bowen ilk, like so I I always looked at them as the off-brand Spurs, just good fundamental basketball. Over um they did make it to a conference final one year, and they did have Zebo. I forgot to mention him, who's now gone, but. You look at Marcus Saul, he's 31, but one thing, you have to look at mileage. So, a, a Marcus Saul at 32 is different than LeBron at 32 because LeBron came into the league at 18 years old. Marcus Saul didn't play his first season until he was 24. So, that's an extra six years of mileage. LeBron, LeBron's first year was 2003, Gasol's first year was 08. So that's a lot of less wear and tear, even though he has had some injury history. Not, not terrible. He's always played at least 50, 50 games, and um, he'll, he'll be playing 60 to 70-plus um, games. Um, and he re- it, he's, a, he's been a defensive player of the year, and um, he now has the ability to shoot the three, which a lot of players like Al Horford, uh, Brooke Lopez, a lot of big men who were good offensive players before have added another um, wrinkle into their game to be able to um, not only survive but thrive in the modern NBA of pace and space. So I think that with uh, a- adding in a Marcus Saul would really be um, would pay huge dividends for the Celtics. And people say, well, he has a big contract. He's making like twenty million this year, and then twenty two, and then twenty three um, over the next three years, but. 20 million is not 20 million in 2017 is not 20 million in even 2013. Avery Bradley will be getting over will be getting 25 million. Evan Turner gets 18 million. Timofey Mozgov gets 16 million. Luol Deng is getting 18, 19 million a year. So, 20 million per year for Marcus Gasol with the way the NBA is right now is almost uh, it's it's a, it's a great it's actually a very good contract it's beneficial it helps his trade value and uh, his game isn't based on athleticism it's bla- it's based on fundamentals IQ um, ability to defend positioning and um, now in now even shooting so he's a type of player like an Al Horford who will age more gracefully than a guy like Blake Griffin and the Celtics need to clear cap room anyway so basically um, what they have to do is. Uh, see if they can get um, 
Marcus Gasol for Avery Bradley, Jay Crowder, Marcus Smart, which seems like a lot, but um, it's the only way to make contracts work um, and make salaries match because they're right up against the cap. So if you were to bring in Marcus Gasol, and the key thing is bring in Marcus Gasol without affecting the future of the team. And when I say future of the team, I'm talking about the real valuable assets that will be contributing and um, high impact members of your next championship team. Avery Bradley, in all likelihood, even though he's a great player and will fit in and is the type of player who can thrive in any situation and is one of the most underrated players in basketball, he'll in all likelihood be gone next year because the Celtics won't be able to pay him and Isaiah Thomas next year. Marcus Smart, who I love, and if you watch him get day in and day out, and even his flopping, like you saw against a game in Houston, even though he lost, it was the Al Horford misses the layup game, which a lot of people were angry at him for. But you look at that, like just what he does to impact winning and stealing the ball and playing tough D. And he he may not he may shoot twenty eight percent from three, but those twenty eight percent of uh the, the those that twenty eight percent comes in big times. So, um, but he'll be making fifteen million a year, and it'll be tough to pay him too. So. You look at that, the, these guys will most likely be gone anyway. And if you can bring in an all-star level player, then I really think you can give the Cavs a run for their money. Because when you look at traditional teams, um, it's usually, and, I, and I, as I've said a million times, the Warriors ruined it. But you could win a championship, most, most likely, most years, with a 1, a 2, and a 3. And when, and when I say a big 3 like that, uh, which is you have a guy who's a clear-cut clear cut guy who's your number one player on a championship team, your clear-cut number two, and your clear-cut number three. You look at the Cavs, perfect example. LeBron James, best player in the world, he's your number one. Kyrie Irving, your clear-cut number two, and Kevin Love, your number three. The Warriors, before they um, uh, got Kevin Durant, had a one in Steph Curry, and I would say two twos in Klay Thompson and Draymond Green. I personally think Klay Thompson's better, but Draymond Green is really improved defensive player. Um, another guy whose value really doesn't show up in the stat sheet. Well, he kind of fills it up, but I wouldn't say in points, that's, but considering the teammates he has. But and now you have. But the NBA is just all out of whack because how are we going to beat a team that has two number ones and two number twos? Like, because I, I would say general consensus, most people would say Clay Thompson's good enough to be the second best player on a championship team. Same with Draymond and Steph and KD are definitely they're both top five players. So. When you look at that, that's unfair. But traditionally, you look at that. And pretty much what the Celtics have assembled right now is a team with a bunch of, like, two and a halves. Like, personally, I think that Gordon Hayward's good enough to be the second best player on a championship team. Isaiah Thomas, offensively, is good enough to be the best player on a, the second best player on a championship team. Al Horford, considering everything he does with the right players, is good enough to be your number two if the skill set of your one and your three are shooters. So... Even though like uh, Al Horford might be better, he won't be the best scorer. Conversely, Isaiah Thomas might not be the best player, but he might be your best scorer. But you kind of look at it. The Celtics currently have like three twos and like three two and a halves. So the Celtics don't necessarily need a number one right now. Obviously, it'd be great. But I think a Jimmy Butler or a Paul George would definitely put them over the top, at least in the East. Um, but... I don't know what to say. Um, the way that the Warriors offseason is shaking out. Kevin Durant, I hate you. And I, I've said this. I would be completely... I would not only be okay, I would be so thrilled if Kevin Durant had a career-ending injury that he could never touch a basketball again. That would... Almost nothing in sports, other than a championship for my one, like one of my favorite teams, would make me as happy as that. Because what this man has done to destroy the competitive balance in the NBA is ridiculous. First, you join a team that won 73 games. A, a team that beat you. A team that you blew a 3-1 lead to. Leaving behind a man who was supposedly your brother. A man who you said in your MVP speech would run through a wall for you. You leave him. And you go to a team that was already a championship team without you. That won two years before. And then the year before you joined them, they went to Game 7 of the NBA Finals. And had they not run into one of the greatest runs ever by LeBron James, they would have been Finals champions again. And 
you would look at Dre, their, uh, one of their best players got suspended for a game, a closeout game, which would have been at home, and their starting center and Andrew Bogut got hurt. So most likely the Warriors would have been back-to-back champions. You join that team. And then, the next year, you take less money, which most players say, that's heroic. Wow, you're, you're taking five, six, seven, eight, nine million less um, to, stay, to stay with the team and allow them to do that. But what, what Kevin Durant did was even further the lack of com- like, c- competition in the league because you're, you can't, you're not supposed to have it all. Fine, you want to have KD, Steph, Clay, and Draymond, but you can't just have one of the best benches in the league with Andre Iguodala and Sean Livingston, and now you're adding um, Omri Caspi, who you can say what you want, but he's a in today's NBA, especially a six foot nine power forward who can shoot the three really well, is valuable. Nick Young, Swaggy P, who if he's one of your starters, uh, you're you're looking like the Lakers. But coming off the bench as an instant offense guy, you're not going to find a much better ninth man coming off the bench to generate instant offense than Nick Young. So. And then, uh, it's just ridiculous. And you know what? The uh, even if you, and, and then a side note, if you're even going to keep those guys because you have bird rights, at the very least, make Joe Lacob pay into the luxury tax. Tax. Make him pay a hundred ninety, two hundred million dollars to keep this team together. But no, this was the most selfish, unselfish act. This is the Rajon Rondo assist of taking less. Wow, because on the va- on, on on face value, look at it. Wow, Rajon Rondo had 16 assists tonight. Wow, he's he really helps his team out. No, he just held the ball for 20 seconds and then passed it to Ray Allen, who's the greatest shooter of all time, and he hit a three, so Rajon Rondo got an assist. He didn't allow the ball to move, and he gets mad at uh, when other team members get an assist and pass the ball off. But yeah, but uh, but when you look at the stat sheet, wow, that looks good. Wow, you look at Kevin Durant taking 53 million instead of 64 million, and you think, wow. He really is unselfish. No, he just wants to. He just wants to keep having rings handed to him, and that just really pisses me off. Um, I really hope, like, I, I hope to God, and I know this is, isn't good karma, and I know it's not right to say, but I hope that Kevin Durant never gets to play basketball again. That's what I wish because the NBA would be a lot better for it. Um, so there's that. Um, a lot of things happening in the NBA. Um. Wanted to touch on the Red Sox quickly. Six-game winning streak as we speak right now. Um, they're they're um, big road trip sweep the um, Blue Jays and they're on the verge of sweeping the um, Texas Rangers. Um, the pitching staff looks excellent. Chris Sale um, back to form. He was great at the beginning of the year. He was only good for a stretch where he was getting wins and getting a lot of strikeouts, but. Get, like his ERA crept up towards three, which is still excellent, especially in the American League. But he was looking more mortal. But now he's just back to being Chris Sale. David Price pitching well. Um, can't speak to what he's doing off the um, off the field. Uh, getting into arguments with media members Dennis Eckersley, um, and then uh, uh, earlier this month, it, uh, last month it was um, uh, was Evan Dietrich or no, who was it? I don't know. Forget forget who it was. Uh, but getting into um oh Drellich was Drellich, um getting into arguments with um all these media members, but uh, his stuff has been dynamite. He's um all of last year. I don't recall David Price being consistently ninety five, ninety six, and touching ninety seven. So his stuff looks really good. Um he's getting back into form. Doug Fister loved the signing. Um you I mean I can't really expect him to be the Doug Fister of twenty fourteen with a sixteen and six record and two point four one ERA, but if you can get like six innings and three runs or five innings and two runs or something like that uh, day in and day out from Fister and hopefully that you're going up against another team's um, like one of their um, lower uh, bottom of the rotation starters and you can spot him four, five, six runs, um, you should be able to win on a consistent basis. He's a solid um, number five pitcher. Drew Pomeranz, who I hate and who I've hated and continue to hate, um, has been pitching better. I'm um, not going to hold my breath um, because, you know, he's he could implode in any minute and go on the DL and not pitch another game for the rest of the year. And next start, it could be three and a third with uh, 103 pitches and five runs and seven walks. So I'm, not com- I'm still not completely sold, but encouraging at the very least uh, what Pomeranz has been doing. Uh, the bats are heating up. Uh, 
Uh, Mookie Betts obviously had that eight RBI game. Uh, Andrew Benintendi heating up. Jackie Bradley average creeping up above 280. Um, again, another guy where uh, when you look back after like this time next month, he could be down to 240. But uh, enjoy the hot streak while it lasts. Uh, and then uh, Hanley Ramirez hitting the ball better. So overall, Red Sox are hot going into the All Star break. Hopefully, we can rack up, uh, pull off a few more wins, and head into the break. Uh, we're and even more in the driver's seat in the division. Um, uh, so uh, other than that, I'll also shout out to Tsu Wei Lin or uh, whatever the third baseman's uh, name is, the Tsunami. Uh, really hitting the ball well over 300 in a short stint. So really looking good. Uh, so tomorrow, July 6th, uh, Gordon Hayward will officially sign his contract and be an official member of the Boston Celtics. Really interested to see what other moves the Celtics make because they um, need to at least clear another two, three million to get to the full max slot to bring in Gordon Hayward on the max contract. So um, as much as it'll hurt, hopefully it is Avery Bradley because he is a guy that you can get real value for. And especially with his contract and the breakout season he had, um, the way he played in the playoffs really um, skyrocketed his value. So who knows, maybe you can get another asset <laughs> to package in the, I don't want to say inevitable, but potential, hopeful, looking increasingly more likely Anthony Davis trade, which uh, I'll talk about in another day. Um, but you know, Danny Ainge is getting all his ducks in a row, and if you can get enough, if you can trade Avery Bradley to another team and try to get another lottery pick, um, whether it be 2019, 2020, or tw even next year, so you, you, I. There, there comes a point where if you have a franchise player who you're not going to win with because you're a terrible organization, um, giving Drew Holiday five years, $126 million with incentives could be $150 million is absolutely ludicrous. Um, and you, you, who else are you going to get? Um, so with your team pretty much stuck with um, what you're at and the, the way the West is right now with there being like eight teams, nine teams, even ten teams better than you, um, there comes a point where if Anthony Davis is unhappy and you're staring down uh, two top five picks next year, uh, another top another lottery pick the next year, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, who looked unbelievable in that summer league game. Not going to get too geeked up about it, but Tatum really looked good. And Jalen Brown, wow. Um, he looked like a man amongst boys. But uh, again, he is a second-year player. But if Jalen Brown can really... It, 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 as as with a lot of Celtics players, it might not manifest in the stat sheet. In the stat sheet, but if he can take another step, and even if he averages 10, 11 points a game, but if he can get his shooting to about 45 percent from the field, for even higher, or 38 percent or higher from three, and uh, cut down on the turnovers, because I do believe he had seven in the summer league game, which is a cause for concern. His uh, handle's still a little bit loose. But if he can make improvement, and Jason Tatum, again, probably not going to get a ton of minutes, but if he can uh, show like he belongs in this league and has star potential, then how can New Orleans or New York, if which is unlikely for them to deal Kristaps Porzingis with um, Phil Jackson gone, but eventually with one of these star players, like trans real transformational young players, um, how are you going to turn down like back to back number three overall picks and uh two uh top five picks and then another few lottery picks and um other rotational players like a Jay Crowder. So that's obviously a pipe dream and looking way down the road. But, you know, still a lot of dominoes to fall for the Celtics, but right now, a lot to be happy about. Um I know there was a lot of disappointment um after seeing what Paul George went for and what Jimmy Butler went for, but Ainge is the GM and he is smarter than all of us as much as I even say fire Danny Ainge on Twitter after Paul George gets traded for a bag of peanuts but you know th they do have a vision and all along Danny Ainge has been saying um, you know we have the ability to draft a high lottery player and bring in a, a high caliber free agent and over the past in 367 days I'll just put it this way between July 2nd of 2016 and July 4th of 2017, uh, or if you want to go back to the draft, uh, or even just ignore the draft, just between those two dates, Danny Ainge was able to acquire Al Horford, a guy who was four-time All-Star, still a player in his prime. He was 30 last year um, when he signed the contract, but 
overall, excellent player for nothing. Just cash, just cap space, which you already had an abundance of. And then again, Gordon Hayward. And all you pretty much have to do is renounce the rights of uh, Kelly Olynyk, Tyler Zeller, Amir Johnson. And uh, you might have to trade like Avery Bradley, which you were probably going to do anyway to recoup some value, or Jay Crowder. So all in all, um, patience, it's not the easiest thing, but it's starting to look like the right thing. And, you know, there's st- we still have assets. And the, the, the future, and all of this really hinges on the development of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown because if they can do in the future, I'm not even talking this year or next year, if in five years Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are able to do what they did in that summer league game in the NBA, in the real NBA, then no matter what Gordon Hayward and Isaiah Thomas and Al Horford you have, that's going to be your championship uh, core along with whether it be Michael Porter Jr., Mo Bamba, DeAndre Ayton, or whichever guy or two guys we get in the high lottery next year. Um, that's going to be the core of the 2021-2022 and beyond Celtics, which will hopefully bring Banner 18, 19, 20, and whatever. But, you know, it's still fun to watch now. And I know you want to say, oh, you got injury, but you never know. Um, if we are able to bring in Marcus Gasol while only giving up a rotational player and a, a less than stellar pick, then do it because... Even if you get to the finals and get swept by um, Golden State, that's going to an NBA Finals is not something to be scoffed at, especially while you still have Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, 2018 Nets, 2018 Lakers slash 2019 Kings, and even that 2019 Memphis pick and whatever you can get to recoup from Avery Bradley slash Marcus Smart or whatever, you, whatever subsequent deal you make. That's the future. So, you know what? Overall, great time to be a Celtics fan, and even though... About 36 hours ago, it didn't look too promising, but, you know, now just got got to like the direction they're heading, and, you know, I think at the very least we got a, another uh, conference final series against Cleveland on our hands, and hopefully we can at least take it six games. So, again, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to all who take the time out of their day and listen to this podcast, and hopefully within the next few weeks um, or maybe in the next month when – Um, free agency dies down and um, these uh, league uh, sources and reporters um, have some more free time on their hands. We can get a a pretty good guest to come in and kind of shed some light on what the Celtics are doing and what's going on around the uh, league. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, Next week, I'll be doing a podcast whether we do have a major guest or not. um, That is still to be determined. But at the very least, you will be hearing my thoughts on what's going on and who knows, maybe Avery Bradley won't be a member of the team and maybe Marcus Saul will, so you never know. But thank you again to all who listen and have a wonderful day.